Good morning. We are in New York. This would be a good afternoon. We just came from Paris. That's the time over there. And, uh, and good evening if you are watching from Australia. Well, I'm Valentin Fuster from New York, and I'm here at Mount Sinai Medical Center. And my task today is to give an overall view of, on a summary of the European Society of Cardiology meeting or Congress that we had in Paris and finished actually yesterday, and also the World Congress of Cardiology. It was a very uh, complex meeting, certainly for me, because usually breaking trials, we have about 15, 20. This time we had 97. And they were not called uh, breaking trials. The name was late breaking signs, which means that not everything presented were the trials. Some advances in science and so forth. I have to give thanks to the American College of Cardiology and to McGraw Hill for sponsoring uh, this uh, event this morning. And I will be very happy to do the best I can since what I'm going to do in one hour is to summarize the 16 studies that I think, I personally think, were perhaps the most interesting one, that may be adding an inch, half an inch, to our present knowledge. So of these uh, 16 studies, actually three, three of them relate to heart failure, uh, three to coronary artery disease intervention, actually four, then we have uh, coronary artery disease, disease antithrombotic agents in acute coronary syndromes. There are three studies. There were three studies on coronary artery disease antithrombotics in a stable disease. And finally, three other studies addressing health or modification of risk factors. So altogether are 16 studies. There are obviously many others, but these are the ones that I decided to choose. Uh, the presentation is going to be by uh, sections. It's not going to be by priority of what is the best study number one. It's not the way I will be presenting. So I will be start uh, presenting the three studies that I thought were quite interesting related to heart failure. Well, uh, the first one actually is, the, is a study that was published in the European... Uh, Heart Journal, but it was presented at the last minute with the results. What was published in the European Heart Journal were actually the protocol, how the study was designed and so forth. But at the last minute, the data was presented, and it's quite fascinating data. Actually, this is the so-called DAPA-HF trial, uh, which uh, was presented by Dr. John McMurray uh, from Glasgow and it's about an SGLT2 inhibitor, dapagliflozin, uh, how it does in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Half of the patients were diabetic, but interestingly, half of the patients were not. So it's a very interesting question for the first time that is being addressed. So uh, we all know that diabetes is frequently associated uh, with heart failure. So therefore, the question was to entail 5,000 patients with heart failure and reduce ejection fraction. The ejection fraction was less than 40%. And in these patients were randomized into dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams once daily, and then placebo, of course, with the standard care. The standard medical care was actually superb. Just to mention that uh, 96% or 96% of the patients actually receive either angiotensin receptor napulisin inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors. 94% receive beta blockers and 71% mineral or corticoid receptor antagonists. So the these groups of patients were actually treated the best way that one can. Now, the study was uh, follow up with a primary endpoint that was actually worsening of heart failure or, um, or, cardio or death related to cardiovascular causes. These were the two primary endpoints. And the follow up was by uh, 18 months. Uh, 
The results were fascinating. In fact, uh, the worsening of heart failure or cardiovascular death at two endpoints actually uh, was in 26% the, the, this composite endpoint was in 26% in favor compared with the placebo. Then if, you, if we go individually uh, to the two uh, separate endpoints, worsening of heart failure, the reduction was by 30%. And in terms of uh, the reduction in cardiovascular death was 18%. So very, very, very striking. What is was most striking is the results were not different in patients with heart failure alone. So there was no need to really have diabetes to show the results that I am presenting and they were presented yesterday. There were adverse events, uh, volume overload, uh, renal dysfunction, etc. but there was no difference between the two groups. And certainly the issue of hypoglycemia and limb amputation was not a question, was not a problem, was equally in both groups. So just summarizing the study, I think is a fascinating study is a new approach that we have in patients with heart failure that actually began with the diabetic population, but now we are beginning to have a tremendous opportunity to have an impact in patients in heart failure as presented in this particular study. So having said this, now let me move into the second study everybody was waiting for, and is about the Paragon HF study. The Paragon HF study is really looking at angiotensin nepilicin inhibitors in patients with heart failure. We already know about patients with heart failure and low ejection fraction, but here we are talking about patients with preserved ejection fraction. So all the data available today is really combining these two drugs in the Paradigm HF trial in which it was shown that indeed hospitalization for heart failure or death related to cardiovascular disease was significantly decreased in these patients with heart failure and low ejection fraction. So now the question is how they do in patients with reasonably good ejection fraction, consider 45% or higher. Well, the patients that were randomized were actually near 5,000 patients with a New York Heart Association class 2 to 4. The ejection fraction, as I mentioned, is 45% or higher. And then these patients uh, actually had elevated levels of natriuretic peptides. It is important to define for a moment heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We all know what we are talking about, but it's important to focus our attention on a, num on a number of components. Two of the most important components in this group of patients is myocardial hypertrophy and fibrosis. Then hemodynamically, we have diastolic compliance problem is impaired, some systolic dysfunction. But just focusing on the hypertrophy and the fibrosis, that's where one of the focuses of the trial was because nepilicin inhibitors actually release a number of peptides that have been considered to decrease fibrosis and hypertrophy. So this was actually one of the focuses of the studies to see maybe we are going to do good in these patients. Well, uh, the results actually were quite negative. Uh, the incidence of death from cardiovascular causes was 8.5% in the sacubitril valsartan group, 8.9% in the valsartan group. The same we can talk about hospitalization for, class for heart failure. The same we can talk about New York Heart Association classification and the Kansas uh, uh, City cardiomyopathy score. So what we like to summarize the study is by saying, unfortunately, unfortunately, that sacubitril valsartan did not result in a significant lower rate of total hospitalization for heart failure and death from cardiovascular causes among patients with heart failure and ejection fraction of 45%. This study was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, the principal investigator, Dr. Scott uh, Solomon, from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and 
certainly a little bit of a frustrating, frustrating results. Well, this leads to a similar study in looking at, at a condition that is very often associated with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. And this is a stiffness of the aorta. The study was very similar, was not part of the same study. This is the so-called evaluate heart failure study. Some of the investigators also participating in the other study that we just mentioned. And the title, as was presented in JAMA, is effect of sacubitril valsartan versus enalapril on aortic stiffness in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. We are all aware that aortic stiffness is becoming a very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease at the present time, as shown recently in many, many studies. So can be modified by these drugs that actually, and particularly sacubitril, may decrease fibrosis and smooth muscle cell proliferation, as we mentioned in the heart, in these cases in the aorta. The study was carried out in, um, in a group of patients, I think there were about 500, randomized into the combination of sacubitril valsartan and enalapril, and then followed for a period of 12 weeks. The, of these 500 patients, average age 67 years, and at 12 weeks, nothing happened. I could say very little changes here and there, but the reality is the combination of sacubitril and valsartan failed in these groups of patients with, um, uh, that had uh, stiffness of the aorta. I like to um, emphasize that these patients actually had a reduced ejection fraction. So this is not the group of patients we would like to see that are patients with uh, preserved ejection fraction and looking at the stiffness was not. So this is one problem. And the other problem is I'm not sure how by the use of a combination of these two drugs you can change something that is so structural uh, like a stiffness of the aorta in a period of 12 weeks. So I would be very cautious by saying this is a negative study. What I would say this is a study that has to be, has to be carried on in patients with um, preserved ejection fraction and for a much longer period of time. So these are the three studies I presented to you, I present to you today in terms of heart failure. And, uh, and the first one, the DAPA HF with DAPA glyphosine, very interesting. <clears throat> Let's now move into four studies related to coronary artery disease intervention. I was expecting, actually, that it would be full of studies on TABAR, MABAR, tricuspid, and so forth. Well, I'm sorry to say that they cannot add more on that in those fields. That's the reality. And what was presented was OK, but certainly not adding too much into what we know. So let's concentrate now into coronary artery disease intervention. And the first two studies, to me, are fascinating. Not, f not scientifically fascinating, but historically they are. And the first study is the so-called syntax trial. Basically, it's the extension of the syntax trial. You know, the syntax trial, you recall, uh, we have a five years of follow-up on a group of 1,800 patients that had either three vessel disease or left main disease and they were randomized into PCI with paclitaxel, uh, a looting stent, or cabbage. And the results, as they were presented at five years, it was a trend by decrease in all-cause mortality in the group with trivestal disease, but not in patients with left main disease. So here's the question. What happened at 10 years of follow-up? What is fascinating to me is that 96% of the patients had follow-up at 10 years, something very difficult in any trial. This really requires a, a, a warm congratulations to everybody involved with the study. But let's now go into the results. In terms of the overall mortality related to um, cardiovascular disease, no, in fact, it's all cause mortality, the, it was not a great difference, 27% in the plaquitaxel eluting stent group, 
and 23% <coughs> in the group treated with cabbage. The significant difference is not in the left main. The significant difference is in three vessel disease with a hazard ratio of 1.41 and being really highly significant. So what we can say is that according to the syntax study that we already hold, know the results at five years of follow-up, now we can say at 10 years of follow-up, there is no question. Cabbage is superior to <coughs> stenting <coughs> in such patients and particularly those with trivessel disease with no difference in left main disease. Uh, I would say that in looking at the diabetes, there was not the statistical power to begin to talk about the diabetic population or not. We published recently the combination of all the studies in which diabetes certainly was in favor of cabbage, but I don't want to discuss this issue in this particular syntax follow-up of 10 years because there was not enough power to talk about diabetes. And the, the other study is fascinating. We all tend to talk about a STEMI stenting, a STEMI stenting. But do you know that 70% of the world, they use fibrinolytic therapy? So it's better we open our minds and begin to ask the question again that was asked in the Dynami 2 study. The Dynami 2 study was a study, was a registration study in Denmark of patients with acute myocardial infarction. And if you recall, uh, most of the institutions actually received the patients, but they had to transport the patients to another institutions to have PCI. And they had, some of them have fibrinolytic therapy in the institutions by themselves. And certainly, the study was fascinating. I, will, I have to go back to history here. <coughs> the first presentation of the Dynami 2 was in 2002. <coughs> and basically, these were patients who received fibrinolytic therapy in a hospital that didn't have uh, 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 they didn't have intervention, and these were compared with the patients who had intervention in the hospitals they could do it. And some of the patients from the hospital that could not do intervention were transferred to the other hospitals. The overall results were actually that um, intervention was better than fibrinolysis. It was a general, if you go back to the paper, it's a general statement. It became much more focused, the second paper, which was actually the eight-year follow-up that was published in 2010. And at that time, just to be more precise, we, are, we were talking about 1,500 patients with a STEMI, in which actually more than 1,000 were at referred hospitals, and about 400 were in invasive hospitals. Now, in some of the um, patients were treated with fibrinolysis in these hospitals that didn't have capabilities for using invasive approaches. But some patients were transferred. And the transfer was fascinating because the median time for a transfer from the moment of randomization was 67 minutes. This is out of the any context I know. So when you interpret the Dynami 2 study is unique because things were so well organized and so fast that at least one has to see the results in this context. Well, the results were interesting, uh, were 35% uh, actually um, in terms of the primary endpoint, uh, which was for the group in these hospitals that they did fibrinolysis versus 41% in the group that actually um, they did um, intervention. And actually, I turned the I have to turn the data around because what they were talking about is a composite of that or reinfarction. If I turn the data around, it was 35% in those who were intervened versus 41% in those who received fibrinolysis. Actually, the difference is not so significant if you look at, but it's due to the fact that the transfers were so well done. So with these two endpoints, now in this meeting, what was presented was the 16-year follow-up. And the 16-year follow-up, even the results get a little closer. Actually, in fact, uh, we talk about the composite of that or rehospitalization for myocardial infarction, 62% in the fibrinolytic group 
and 59% actually in the intervene group. So it's just to, to show that if you are in a place in which you cannot do intervention, but you do lytic therapy, or you transfer the patients very quickly to the places that can do intervention, you can do very well. This is Denmark. I'm not entirely sure we can talk in the same about other countries, but this is one of the aspects that was worth to mention. Now, the next study that I like to uh, talk about now is the so-called complete study, after these two historical studies, the syntax and the dynamy. And this is important study because it's randomized. A patient comes with a STEMI. You do the culprit lesion or you do both, the culprit lesion and all the other lesions that appear to be significant. How significance was interpreted in the study that I'm going to present? The significance was, was, uh, was um, actually categorized if there were lesions of more than 70% or a positive FFR of less than 0.8 with lesions between 50 and 60%. What the study are we talking about? The complete trial, which was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine as complete revascularization with multivessel disease, PCI, for myocardial infarction. The first author is Dr. Shamir Mehta from the McMaster's University. And I'm now going to define the problem. Well, you know the issue. There are many observational studies, biased studies, some studies the lesions, you have the culprit lesion, but you have other lesions. You don't know if they are stable, if they are not. You don't know if they are significant, they are not. So it has been a confusion in the field. That's the reality. Now, this study, in my view, is unique. And the reason it's unique is actually randomized. It's a large number of patients, as I will mention. And certainly, the only question is, I'm not sure how severe these patients are, because the issue of risk, as you know, patients with shock, you are not going to follow this approach. You just go to the culprit lesion and that's it. So one has to look at how severe it was. But let's go into the study. The study was a randomized STEMI patients, multivessel coronary artery disease, who, had, uh, who um, actually undergo either culprit lesion, PCI, or either complete revascularization uh, with PCI in angiographically significant uh, disease, as I define. It is important to know that uh, one third, or actually about half of these patients, the um, PCI done on the non culprit lesions were done within the first 45 days, not at the time of the patient being in the hospital. I will tell you there was no difference, just to start. If you do it in the hospital or you wait a little longer within 45 days. But I think this is important to actually define the study. Now, the first co primary outcome was composite of cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. And the second co primary outcome was the composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and ischemic revascularization. Actually, the median follow up was three years. And here were the results. First, if we talk about the co-primary outcome, and I repeat, cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction was actually was 7.8% in the complete revascularization uh, group versus 10.5% in the culprit lesion alone. When you, lo when you look at the second co-primary outcome, as I mentioned, the composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, but you are ischemic revas driven revascularization, the results were more significant. 8.9% in the complete revascularization group versus 16.7% in the culprit lesion route. No difference the timing of the complete revascularization, as I mentioned, which is at the, whether it's done at the time of the patient being first admitted to the hospital or within the first 45 days. I think the summary is exciting. <clears throat> the question is how sick these patients were. And this is in the discussion. The sense that one gets is that the patients were moderately sick, and I cannot go any further. But I think here is the challenge. When we talk about total revascularization versus culprit revascularization, I think the first question we have to ask ourselves, is this patient reasonably stable? 
And if it is stable and the other vessels are significantly affected, total revascularization may be justified. If the patient is in shock, is in shock, it is not justified. And if the patient is very mild disease in the other vessels, it's not justified. So I, we cannot go any further, but this is where the discussion and the editorial comment really moves forward. So we are beginning to have some sense about this important field because I, I will tell you, uh, I have the figure, 50% uh, per, um, of the patients that present with a STEMI have multivessel disease. So this is an issue that we have to deal every day with. So I finished now this particular complete study, and I, I still have one that goes into coronary artery disease intervention, the biodegradable stains. Well, you know this story. If we go back biodegradable stains a year ago, and we presented some information, the data was very equivocal and very worrisome. First, because the biodegrading takes more than two, three, four years, not take place in two, three months as it was thought. And the results were very questionable comparing biodegradable stents with other kinds of stents. The study presented in Paris is a little bit different because our stents that are really very, very new. And the study is called the BioSTEMI study. It was actually published simultaneously in The Lancet with the title, Biodegradable Polymer Sirolimus Eluting Stents versus Durable Polymer Eberolimus Eluting Stents in Patients with ST Segment Elevation Myocardial Infarction. Well, the study uh, was actually presented by Dr. Juan Iglesias, and he's from uh, Geneva, University Hospitals in Geneva, and it's actually is a Swedish study, in um, uh, uh, excuse me, a study from Switzerland entailing 10 different hospitals. Well, um, it's a multi-center study, as I mentioned. Uh, patients had acute STEMI, and they were eligible all to participate, and they were randomly allocated into a biodegradable polymer, Sirolimus eluting stent. All had thin struts, and the other was not biodegradable, but also with a thin strut. So these are really the most advanced type of, of uh, devices that we have today in terms of stents. And they were compared actually one to one. The follow-up <coughs> actually was 12 months, and the primary endpoint was very much targeted to the lesion failure. They consider lesion fail failure cardiac death. Could be, could be not. I think it's questionable. But they, they also talk about <coughs> certainly lesion revascularization and, and, and target vessel infarction. <coughs> Well, let's go now into the results. First of all, let's say that the number of patients that participated in this study were 1,300. They were appropriately randomized, as I mentioned. And then the results were actually uh, not too different. The primary composite endpoint of the target lesion failure in the patients that were treated with the biodegradable stent was 4%, where in the others was actually 6%. So, and all due to a reduced ischemic driven target. This was not related to that. This was not related to myocardial infarction. So here is the question. We have new stents with very narrow struts. This is the critical. The only differentiation that we have, one group is biodegradable and the other is not. And actually, thus far, the difference, if any, is very trivial. Now, one of the questions that is brought out, and I think is a very pertinent question, the follow-up of um, 12 months is very short when you are talking about something that is biodegrading. You don't know how long it takes to biodegrade. So I think I would take this study as saying, <coughs> maybe all of our concerns about degradable stents are going away, and now we are looking more, what about the long follow-up? how these stents do compare with the best stents available? I think that's really the question that has to be answered in the future. It's interesting, though, how things advance. I remember discussing just a year ago how concerned we were about the de biodegradable stents. Just in one year, you see how things are turning around. 
Well, this is all about coronary artery disease intervention, two historical studies, the syntaxes and the dyn dynamic, the complete study, total revascularization, and the biostem study comparing biodegradable stents versus not. Now we talk about antithrombotics. I can tell you, not easy to follow all of this. Many of these studies were actually published simultaneously. So you can go to the trial. I certainly didn't go to the 97 studies. So I have to rely a lot into what is published. And one thing that you see when something is published simultaneously is done fast. For example, you go to the statistics. Are there, but you want to know more about it. You go to the discussion, and the discussion is repetitive. You go into the details of the study, and you don't find them. And this is an issue as editor of a journal of Jack that I have been very concerned and that is the simultaneous publication that when it is presented is all done very fast. And as you go to review them, you have lots of gaps that you cannot fill. And this is what I'm saying. And this doesn't apply also to these antithrombotic studies I'm going to mention. It applies also to all the other studies that I present. Not all, but some that is simultaneous presentation. I say because you're going to read all these studies and you will have a number of questions that I don't think are being answered too quick. Let me go now into the studies. The first one is actually the ESAR REACT 5 trial. This study was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine and is a very important one. It's an important question. Ticagrelor or Pasugrel in patients with acute coronary syndromes. We all know based on previous studies, which I am not going to uh, elucidate right now, that in acute coronary syndrome is a high-risk population in which ticagrelor or pasugrel have been found to be superior to clopidogrel in, a in, a, in, a, in, a, in, make, in um, working or, or intervening in these patients with acute coronary syndrome. Which one of the two is better? And this is what the study tried to answer. The uh, presenter was Dr. Schupke. Uh, he's uh, from Munich in Germany. And let's now go into uh, the, the, um, the actually the study in itself. The patients get acute coronary syndromes. Interesting, 40% were STEMI and 60% were non-STEMI. Uh, the patients received ticagrelor or prasugrel. And the primary endpoint was the composite of dead myocardial infarction or a stroke at one year. And a secondary endpoint was actually bleeding. Ticagrelor was done right away as the patient presented into the hospital, as you do. And Prasugrel, for a number of reasons, was given data after the anatomy uh, was, uh, was known. The, uh, the, I'm trying to figure the, the dose. Um, Therapy with Pasugel was started a loading dose of 60 milligrams and continued at a, med at a maintenance of 10 milligrams. The loading dose of uh, Ticagrelor was 180 milligrams and was maintenance 90 milligrams twice daily. This is actually what is being done uh, routinely. Well, let's see what happened here. We had 4,000 patients and actually, interestingly, the winner was Pasugel. I just say this from the beginning, at all the endpoints, even the endpoint of bleeding, which is the one you are always worried about, and actually was the same between Ticagrelor and Pasugrel. On the ischemic aspect, Pasugrel was superior. Let me give you the data. A primary endpoint event, remember that I mentioned myocardial infarction, death, or a stroke. 9.3% in the Ticagrelor group, 6.9% in the Pasugrel group. Individual components, uh, death, 4.5 tacagrelor versus 3.7 prasugrel. Myocardial infarction, 4.8 tacagrelor, 3% prasugrel. Stroke, 1.1 versus 1%, no difference in this case. And certainly bleeding was the same. <coughs> so here we have a situation that is interesting and is something that I think is worth knowing the uh, lower incidence of problems with the, uh, actually with the Pasugrel. And the main aspect that was really very successful versus <laughs> Ticagrelor was in myocardial infarction as the end point. What we are going to do in the, in the future, 
What is going the, to be the cost? What is going to be the availability? This is something that I cannot discuss at this time, but the data is a strong data and is quite interesting. Well, the second study is actually uh, very interesting. It's a genotype strategy study. Um, this study is so-called Popular Genetic Trial and was published also in the New England Journal of Medicine. And here is the old question. When we give patients ticagrelor, uh, or excuse me, when we give clopidogrel, 30% of the patients actually clopidogrel doesn't work. And one of the main reasons it is being said is has to do with the metabolism in the liver that can be addressed genetically. This is the question. Well, this field has been going on for 10 years. But perhaps the study I'm going to be presenting today is the most interesting one because of the large number of patients and the meticulous way that the study was actually done. <coughs> and it's time to address this question. Well, these patients all had a STEMI <coughs> undergoing PCI with a STEM implantation. And one group received um, um, the clopidogrel um, or the other drugs but what this was done is a study of genotyping and to find out if the genotyping was negative for clopidogrel or was not. And another group was treated with pasugrel or ticagrelor, completely independent. And I will tell you the results without going into too much detail, but basically in the group of clopidogrel, that they found that the genetics were not adverse. The results were exactly the same that the group treated with pasugrel or ticagrelor. There's no need to present to you the specific data, but just the concept is very important, and that is maybe, maybe a quick genetic study, which can be done right away, can tell you what are you dealing with when you have these patients. So uh, I think the study is interesting, and certainly it opens the question again that how to address the issue of clopidogrel that is not gone, as the study shown, in patients who require PCI. But here comes another study that I think is interesting <coughs> and is also favoring clopidogrel. And it's patients over age of 70. The study is called the Popular Age Study. And this is the story. You have a patient with an acute coronary syndrome. And as we said, the standard is, is pasugrel versus ticagrelor. But the patient is over age of 70. <coughs> and the question is, these patients have more a tendency to bleed. And this is one of the problems, as you know, particularly with ticagrelor and pasugrel versus clopidogrel. So what do you do with this patient? No literature. Because most of the studies avoided to use patients over age of 70, 75. Well, here we have a study that they look at such patients, 70, 75. Well, the study, uh, I would like to uh, actually summarize it uh, as um, were 1,000 elderly patients over age of 70. The acute coronary syndrome was non-ST elevation, and the patients were actually um, uh, used, a group who used clopidogrel, 75 milligrams once daily, and the other group used pasugrel or ticagrelor. <coughs> The study, I don't think, was actually a randomized study. I have to say I should go into more detail, but I can tell you the results, and that is the elderly population did well with clopidogrel. And therefore, it opens the question of whether, with our obsession of acute coronary syndromes, always pasugrel versus ticagrelor, whether if we have patients over age of 70, we might not be thinking twice that perhaps clopidogrel is sufficient as with the genetic study. So what I'm saying, what is happening in the acute coronary syndromes and, P and in PCI and in the thrombotic field is that the use of drugs now are really going, is using all of them and see if we can go to those that are most feasible and perhaps less expensive. And one of them is clopidogrel that in acute coronary syndromes has been highly questioned. Well, we have already two studies in which there is a possibility that salvaging clopidogrel in acute coronary syndromes. Well, having said this, these are the ISAR uh, 
uh, study Tai Carlo versus Paso Grill, and then these two trials that Clopido Grill at least is emerging again. Now we have coronary artery disease, antithrombotic agents in a stable coronary artery disease. Just to tell you from the very beginning, we are talking about patients that maybe a year ago might have had more than a year ago, or might have PCI or cabbage, or might be talking with patients that never have an intervention. So just focus your head for a moment into the kind of patient that comes to you chronically and the previous history, you don't know much. Now, in the three studies, they tell you a specific about the previous history, but it's a chronic patient. Whatever previous history I talk happened long time ago. All right. The first study that I'm going to present to you is the Themis PCI study. These are diabetic patients with a stable coronary artery disease, and a stable means no myocardial infarction or a stroke in the past. That's what they call voice tail. But doesn't mean they didn't have PCI or they didn't have cabbage or they had nothing, but they didn't have myocardial infarction or a stroke. Now, what is the question? Why they are now going to look at what happens with these patients with ticagrelor when the chronic patients, we have been treating them with clopidogrel? And the reason is because diabetes, we are all told, that is similar to a high-risk population. So they are using a little bit the thinking of what we do with acute coronary syndromes, that we use pasugrel and ticagrelor. We don't use, actually, clopidogrel. And now let's go to the diabetic population in chronic disease. Maybe we should use ticagrelor rather than clopidogrel. That's the question that is being answered. I will tell you a complex paper to go over the paper in great detail, very complex. And actually, I will say to you that perhaps rather than going into a lot detail, let me just say, first, it was published in The Lancet. Our friend Deepak Bhatt was the principal investigator from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then I will tell you, was a multi-center study in 42 countries. Actually, there were 1,000 in uh, um, institutions in 42 countries. And the number of patients that uh, we are going to be discussing are all about 12,000 patients or so forth. So it's a large study with a follow-up of three years. Now, now I want to define themis, T-H-E-M-I-S. I told you are PCI patients, cabbage patients, and are patients with no intervention, and, but all of them did not have myocardial infarction or stroke. Here, I am only talking about the PCI group, okay? Forget about all the others. And this is called Themis PCI, because in a moment, I will talk about the Themis with all the patients I presented. This is just PCI. What it was found was very, very borderline. Very, very borderline, because here's the story. The, these patients uh, were actually assigned to ticagrelor and aspirin versus aspirin alone. And this is the question that is being asked. These are patients that had the intervention a long time ago. You say, why they are not on clopidogrel? Well, this is a long time ago. This is what I'm actually emphasizing. And then this is what happened. When you look at the data, here you have the primary, key, the primary efficacy endpoint, which is actually a composite of cardiovascular dead, myocardial infarction, or a stroke, was actually 7.5% in one group and 8.6% on the other. So uh, ticagrelor was better than actually the patients who did not have ticagrelor. All patients were on aspirin. 7.5% versus 8.6%, not much. And then when you go into intracranial hemorrhage, also the, in this case, the ticagrelor did a little bit worse than the control group. is 2% versus 1%. So you have here 1% on one side favors ticagrelor, 1% on the other side, it favors no ticagrelor. Next paper. And the next paper, actually, uh, is uh, in the New England Journal, and is actually the same Themis study, but here are all the groups I presented to you. Cabbage, PCI in the past, coronary artery disease in the past, but no infarction, no stroke. And they look at the diabetic population again. These patients actually are more diluted because are not following PCI. 
the results were quite negative here. Here you cannot say even to consider. And this is common sense. This is all diluted with all the patients' chronic coronary artery disease. So my friends give aspirin. That's the story. Well, now we are getting into the next aspect that is uh, the actually the third one, that is the AFIRE study. Let me explain to you this. It's still antithrombotic therapy in chronic coronary artery disease. Now the patient has atrial fibrillation. And the patient had in the past whatever you like. Cabbage, PCI, infarction, stroke. Here is everything, all comers. But the patient had, in this case, has atrial fibrillation and has coronary artery disease, any kind that you want. But it's a chronic case. And the question is, what do you do? Well, I will tell you what the guidelines say uh, just recently. So we are not going about a year ago. But the guidelines say, be careful with using anticoagulants plus two inhibitors if the patient is reasonably after PCI soon. So use it for a short period of time, but then you go for six weeks or so with an anticoagulant plus a platelet inhibitor. And after a few weeks, and you are getting into the chronic stage, you may use monotherapy. This is interesting because I didn't know. And you use an anticoagulant alone. I'm talking about coronary artery disease long after, whatever happened before, an anticoagulant alone. This is in the guidelines. So I went to the guidelines and I said, where this is coming from? I didn't know. Well, there is a Dutch uh, cohort study. It was uh, actually, um, um, you know, with this, um, um, you know, they have this fantastic resort of, of every patient being, being uh, getting into a system in which you can know everything. What they found is that monotherapy in patients with chronic coronary artery disease using an anticoagulant does good. This is in general. What the study here is about, they use a particular anticoagulant, which is rivaroxaban. That's what they study. You know, rivaroxaban is coming in coronary artery disease from all fronts, in chronic coronary artery disease. So this is one. The patient has atrial fibrillation, long coronary artery disease, and here's the question. Here is, um, is um, uh, patients who use monotherapy, 10 to 15 milligrams of rivaroxaban. How so low? Japan. People are smaller. So 10 to 15 milligrams they use, not 20 milligrams. And then, and the other was a combination of rivaroxaban plus a single platelet inhibitor. And the majority of patients were actually patients that were used aspirin. The, it's, it's a non-inferiority study with a primary safety endpoint uh, in which very much focus on the issue of bleeding. Let me make the long story short. And that is, when this study was done, the primary efficacy endpoint, that is ischemic events, there was no much difference between mono monotherapy, rivaroxaban alone, versus rivaroxaban and asthma. It's nice to know, because this is coming from other studies. But in bleeding, there was a difference. And that is, the combination was 2.76% of bleeding versus monotherapy, 1.6. So here are the results, what they suggest is in patients with chronic coronary artery disease, we should begin to talk about rivaroxaban as a monotherapy. Remember, there is no aspirin here. So it's a new coming culture that is evolving very slowly from a number of studies, is how these new oral anticoagulants can do good for patients with coronary artery disease as well as patients with atrial fibrillation because they had both. So this is the study. And now, I have three other studies uh, that uh, have to do with uh, alteration of risk factors. The first one I think is important. You have an obese patient and the patient is diabetic. And you say, well, bariatric surgery, what do we call now metabolic surgery, as you know, versus the usual medical therapy. There's a lot published in the literature, but certainly not a study as large as this one. Again, it started at the Cleveland Clinic, which were really pioneers in this field. And we are talking about over 2,000 patients. 
that actually uh, either they underwent, they actually were randomized into uh, metabolic surgery versus non-surgical approach. Was the randomization was one to five. And that is many more patients had diabetes and obesity. I don't want to call this a strict randomization because it was not, but certainly is a large number of patients in which they look actually at the endpoints that we like to look at. And that is what about all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure, nephropathy, atrial fibrillation. All of this was looked at. The results were outstanding for bariatric surgery, I have to say to you. I can give you figures of any parameter, 30% versus 47%. Uh, 17% versus 10%. I'm talking about, they look at six parameters. That to tell you the difference in endpoints is very significant on any endpoint when you do bariatric surgery versus you follow these patients, obese patients with a BMI of more than 30 and patients who actually have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, all being treated medically the best they can. So I think the study is telling us something that we should think and think again about bariatric surgery. But there's something missing here. What about side effects of bariatric surgery? That's the key issue here, because very, it's very, well, I can tell you the data. And the data is 28% had some side effect. Okay, so this puts the study a little bit into the question. What were the side effects? In fact, not very significant, because we thought cardiac events, 1%, renal failure, um, less than 1%, uh, requiring abdominal surgical intervention, again, 5%, uh, death, so 1%, endoscopy required because something is not right, 16%. Are side effects, but, uh, you know, 28%, but when you look at it, it's not so bad. So I think we have to change our view and begin to look at this much more seriously in patients with diabetes and obesity. And here we are in the last two studies with risk factors. I have seven minutes left, I guess. And, and this is a very interesting one uh, because of the concept. The concept is very important, and this concept is beginning to evolve in the genetic field. And that is, you look at blood pressure, and you look at LDL, and all the studies, five years follow-up. Now we begin to see 10 years follow-up. But what about if you have the genetic background of the patient that fits with the blood pressure, and the genetics don't change. They may change epigenetics, but let's assume the genetics don't change. So a given blood pressure with a genetic variable being identified may prolong what you find in a short term, in a long term. Uh, I'm just talking, generally speaking, is a new approach, and this is what was used in this study. The study actually uh, was um, published in JAMA. Uh, the uh, main investigator from the University of Cambridge and the United Kingdom was Dr. Brian Ferenc. And they, they use a very important enterprise. And this is what the biobanks are going to be in the future. Very critical, very critical. They use the UK biobank. To me, the number one in the world. And this is followed by biobanks that are being developed in China and in other places. Uh, I am not saying that I am pro-British now on the biobank, but certainly the data that is beginning to evolve from that biobank is fascinating because everything is surveilled genetically and any risk factor is surveilled with the most recent genetic tools that we have available. Well, they have f uh, half a million participants uh, that were involved in the UK biobank. And they look at uh, LDL cholesterol and systolic blood pressure. And then they look at the whole genetic background of all the different numbers of blood pressure. And they ended up saying, you know, a blood pressure of this kind, this, this genetic variable, a blood pressure of this kind, this, this genetic variable, let's see what happened with these patients over a, a short period of time in terms of cardiovascular events, and we will be able to prolong what would, hum, would happen in a long term by that, just looking at this concept. Well, the result is fascinating, but I can give you one example, just to give you the example. You have, for example, you drop LDL cholesterol by 14 milligrams in a patient who has a high cholesterol, and uh, LDL, you drop it by 14 milligrams in a blood pressure by five millimeters of mercury. Okay, 
you follow this patient for about a year or two, and you compare with a patient who has an LDL cholesterol that is normal and a blood pressure that is normal. And you see a difference, let's say a difference in terms of cardiovascular events uh, between uh, 4% and 2% at one year, okay? Now, you use this genetics and then you prolong forever and it's a 50% reduction, but you can imagine when you go for not one year, for 50 years, and then you see the impact. And this really brings us into statistics. When we talk about absolute impact versus relative impact, it's very, very important. So these genetic tools we are going to be able us to really prolong what we see in a short time by looking the whole genetic profile and trying to see what the impact will be in the long term. And this is also what is done statistically with the Bayesian approach. The Bayesian approach is basically accumulating events over a period of time, but it's still during the period that you are studying the patient. Here is belong is prolonged after the period that you have been studying the patient. So I think this is actually very fascinating. And the study basically says that if you use the DASH diet, in which you have a little bit of lower LDL and a little bit of salt, they, they, they prolong here an incredible uh, uh, impact when you go into genetics that they just at the beginning may be very little, but for a long period of time has a significant impact. Is a conceptual paper which I think is quite interesting. And here's the final one, which is the actually the, the paper was published in The Lancet. It comes from the Hope 4 study. And that is, this is a study that uh, presented by uh, the group at, um, in Colombia because it was done in two countries, Colombia and Malaysia. And these are under the auspices of Dr. Yusuf, uh, that is uh, involved with the PURE study. And the study is actually fascinating, and we all know about it. We are talking about uh, 14,000 individuals with poorly controlled blood pressure from 30 communities in Colombia and Malaysia. And this is very simple. You put a system there that not necessarily are doctors. It's a system of people that are uh, non-physician, health workers, that do it, they work together, and they work simply in making things to happen. And what the paper is showing is what we are beginning to see in many community studies when in fact are run by health workers and not necessarily just by physicians. We can actually direct the studies. And the results that they present here were very significant in terms of how impact you may have in, re in reducing blood pressure following the Framingham score and so forth and impact in these patients by just following a completely different approach. And that is not getting rid of physicians, but really enhancing the health system with other people who do the work. I don't go into the details. So this is, I finish the, my presentation today, at least the best I could do, in saying that our 16 studies out of 97, I have here nine or 10 more that I could talk about it, but at least what we can remember is that in heart failure, the use of dapaglifosin can be quite interesting. A, a, a drug has been used for diabetes. In the intervention studies, it's fascinating the syntax and the dynamic too, how they have been followed for a long period of time, but most important, the complete study, perhaps in medium, in medium risk patients with STEMI, that we can do revascularize the whole system, or at least the arteries that are non-culprit, that have significant disease. And then in acute coronary syndromes, I think the most important study in my view was the Ticarlor versus Pasugrel, when we saw the role of Pasugrel. And then we have in a stable coronary artery disease, we have the fact that the diabetes may be similar to coronary artery disease, but don't start using Pasugrels and Ticarlors, in particularly in the chronic patient, because you don't see a difference. And the issue of the AFIRE study with rivaroxaban at a low dose in patients with chronic coronary artery disease, it adds to the other studies that are coming out using rivaroxaban in patients with coronary artery disease. And finally, in terms of the risk factor profile, bariatric surgery is number one. The genetic approach to long follow-up of patients when we have a short follow-up and the importance of community work done by people in the health system
that can really put together what is shown in the study that I just presented. Well, Ben, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all.